morning. How are we all doing? Good. Had a good weekend? Good. Peace with me. That's good. Wow, we. All right. Thanks, team. Can we thank the team? Yeah, there we go. Now we're a bit more up and about. It's good. We're, uh, if we haven't met before, my name's Ryan, and uh, great to be here with you this morning and uh, sharing God's Word. Uh, if you were here last week, you would have known we uh, started a new series, uh, not called Make Your Life Count, but that's okay. We're, we are going on a little bit of a journey of uh, Bible in, in scriptures out of the Bible in one year. So I don't know, anyone do, does anyone do the Bible in one year, Nicky Gumbel, Express, or, or the normal version? There's a few of us out there. You know, one of the things that we've been kind of talking about as a church is, is loving God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And one of the things that we know is, is going to help us do that, one of the things that we know is going to be key to that is having a good grounding in the Word of God. And so in this series, we're going to be kind of pulling out some uh, verses of Scripture that hopefully if you're on this journey, journey of a, a Bible in one year, you would have uh, perhaps read uh, some of these this week. You might uh, Last week, you might have come across that. And as you know, we're, we're journeying in this series, our hope would be that uh, you, it would trigger what you've been reading during the week. And not to say that everybody has to be a uh, Bible in one year, you know, we're not going to check you at the door and say, are you reading the Bible? No, this is, today's not for you. That, that's not going to happen. But here's, here's what we recognize is that the best way to, to be uh, absorbing God's Word and to be in God's Word is to have a plan. That if you don't have some kind of plan, odds are it's going to be haphazard. I know for me, if I'm not using a, a reading plan, you know, I try to be clever. Two years ago, I was like, the Bible in a year, you know, I feel like I, I've worked on that one uh, enough. I'm going to, and I was like, I'm going to try something else. You know, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to try this one for a month, and then I'm going to try this. And you know what? I, it just didn't work. What I love about the Bible in a year is it, it keeps you on track. Uh, it keeps you kind of in the Scriptures. It keeps you around all kind of New Testament, Old Testament. You're reading kind of a good variety. There's a nice devotional in there. And so it's just a great way to kind of go, every day there's, a, there's an opportunity for me to be in the Word of God with a plan that is structured. And it's not about the structure, it's not about ticking the box, it's not about your, your hot streak, as angry as I get when mine dissolves. Uh, I have a, a bad habit of reading the Bible sometimes late at night and then uh, it ticks over and I lose my streak and then I think JP, one of our, our youth pastors, is going to tell me off because I don't know, at one point he had an unbelievable streak. I don't know if it's still going or not. You should ask him about it. But it did get over 365 days. That's very impressive. Uh, but the reality is if we don't have a plan to immerse ourselves in the Word of God, we know uh, that we're not always going to be able to you know, do that. And so my, my encouragement to you at the start of this and the start of uh, this morning is to, before you, you, know, before you get into your, your, your Monday, uh, sometime today, have a, have a think about what the plan and the rhythm of your life is around reading the Word of God. And if you don't have a plan, I'd encourage you to make a plan. If you've got a plan and maybe you've deviated from that a little bit, that's okay. And maybe you're, you're like JP and you have a streak of 365 days in your plan. Let me encourage you, keep going. And in fact, come see me and encourage me because, you know, mine is not at 365 days. Uh, so, you know, I need some encouragement there. But for all of us, it's not about getting it right. It's about immersing ourselves in the Word of God so that we can learn to love God a little bit more with, with who we are. And so this morning, we're going to jump into a passage of Scripture in, in, in a few moments' time. But before, before we get there, I just was uh, reading and, and thinking about this passage, and, and, and it, it let me to think of this. Have you ever kind of read a book on someone's, like their biography, not so much their autobiography, maybe you've kind of been to a, a funeral service for someone in, in your life, I know that's a bit grim to get started, but the, the reality is when there's a reflection on, on someone's life, uh, you learn a lot about them that maybe you didn't already know. Or, or maybe you, you hear stories shared about them that you, you hadn't heard before as an opportunity to, re, to reflect on someone in a different way. You know, uh, a little while ago, uh, a great cricketer in Australia, Shane Warne, passed away. And uh, Shane Warne was known as a, 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 just a larrikin spin bowler, uh, you know, just great cricketer. But one of the things that came out over and over again about Shane Warne after his passing was the level of generosity that he had in his life that all of these people and stories came out about how he bought them things and he gave things away and he paid people's debts and he was this incredibly generous uh, individual. To stay on the sport theme just for a little while because it's easy for me to do, Kobe Bryant, another athlete who, quite famous uh, athlete, passed away suddenly. Uh, life ended uh, way sooner than it, than it probably shouldn't in an accident. And I, uh, I had a little bit of a, a, a bitter kind of feeling towards Kobe Bryant because he played for the arch nemesis of the Boston Celtics in the LA Lakers. And so I always just saw him as like a, a fierce competitor, which he was, but kind of almost like enemy lights. But then you start reading his books and hear, hear these stories of the, 
the impact that he had on individuals. That he would go so far out of his way to, to mentor young players and, and do things uh, in his life with his, with his wealth and his generosity. And you read his story and he is this phenomenal individual. Maybe, like I said, you've been to a, a, a funeral service where you, you hear the reflection on someone's life and the impact and the difference that they've made in the, in the world that they lived in. You know, so often we, we don't get to, to see the impact of the life that we have right now and, and what we're doing right now. Sometimes it needs a little bit of hindsight to, to see at the end. Sometimes there's, there's stories that just can only be, be shared afterwards. Sometimes there's that ability to gather and reflect on things and, and see what a life lived well actually looked like. And these verses we're going to look at in, in Deuteronomy 34 today are a little bit like that. They're, they're the, the verses that uh, take us to the, the very end of Moses' life. Uh, for those of you who, who know Moses, he, he led the people out of, out of Egypt and through the wilderness and did incredible uh, miracles in his life. Uh, you know, I look at some of the miracles that Moses did in his life, I'm like, could I have one of those, Lord? Um, just one? You know, like tap the rock and it's water and do this and it's food. and Just in, incredible things that he saw in his life as he lived out a faithful life to God. And so you can see on the, the screen there, the, the idea of what I wanted to go for this morning is what does it look like for us to make our life count? What does it look like to, you're not always going to know what it's going to look like until the end necessarily, and you know, that, that's not the, the end of the story here, but it's what are we doing right now that as we live our life, that is going to enable us to make a, a life that count? And we're going to take a, a few moments just to have a look at these, these verses out of Deuteronomy and have a look at kind of this, this picture of Moses' life at the, at the very end. So you can, you can read along with me if you want. It says, Then Moses went up to Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab and climbed Pisgah Peak, which across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead as far as Dan, all the land in Nepali and the land of Ephraim and Messina and all of Judah, extending to the Mediterranean Sea. Then Negev, the Jordan Valley with Jericho, the city palms as far as Zor. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not enter that land. So Moses and the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord said. The Lord buried him in the valley near Beth, Peor in Moab. But to this day, no one knows the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyesight was clear and he was strong as ever. The people of Israel mourned for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days until the customary period of mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord commanded Moses. There has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. The Lord sent him to perform all the miracles, signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land with mighty power. Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all of Israel. You know, I've read this scripture a few times and the one thing I've always kind of dwelled upon was that Moses got to see the land, but he never got to go in it. And how almost like that was a failure for Moses. It's kind of the, the way I always read it. But as I was kind of reading this this week and, and kind of unpacking that, you see that there's like a, a beauty to the end of this story of Moses' life. You know, Moses wasn't going to enter the, the his, his, his leadership time had, had, was coming to an end and going to come to an end, and he wasn't going to take the people on that next leg of the journey. But I love that God gets him to climb this mountain and shows him the promise that he'd given to him that his people would go into this land. He gets a, a glimpse of what's going to be next. And it's this great reminder for us that we need to make the most of where we are right now. You know, the, the word land in this, this scripture just appears a lot of times, like it, this land and then there's the land and he takes him to this land and he shows him this. And if you look at the, the thread of Moses' life, land plays a massive part of his life. You know, he's, he's in the land of Egypt that, you know, gets the people out of there, and then he's in the, the, the land of, of the wilderness. And his whole mission is to, to lead these people towards the, the promised what? The promised land. There's this thing about Moses that it was always about where his feet were and allowing God to move where he was right there and then. You know, you, you read kind of the, 
the exit of Egypt and all the, 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 the plagues and all the things that, that happened in all those miracles, you know, and it, it seems like it all happens in a, in a really short burst and then he's out in the wilderness for a long time. But, you know, they're, they're, they're circling around the, the, the wilderness out there, but you know what? God does all these great miracles through Moses in that space as well. And I love the, the, the very end. He, he gives him one more what glimpse at the land. One more glimpse of what was promised to the people. One more glimpse of what the future of all that he had done would look like. You know, in our lives, it's, we're not necessarily traveling all around the place and, and leading people through deserts and out of slavery and all these things, but there is this picture and call I see for, for God's people that it's about where we are right now. I don't know about you, but I, I'm trying to catch myself doing this all the time. When you, you see someone and they say, what's been happening? And you say, not much. You know, I caught up with someone that I hadn't seen for five years. And they're like, what have you been doing? I'm like, oh, not much, same old. <laughs> it's been five years. Like, I've had like one kid in that five years. <laughs> you know, like, not much, you know, same, same stuff, different day. You know, yeah, I tend to say that. We can get into this cycle that it just feels like we're just doing the same thing over and over again. And to a degree, sometimes that can be true. You know, you might have had the same job for five years. But if the same things happen in your job every day for five years, your life must be really boring. Like, I imagine that movie, Great, Great, what is it, Groundhog Day? Has anyone seen that? And he, like, wakes up, it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. I think sometimes we convince ourselves that our lives is Groundhog Day. That I'm just going to get up, I'm just going to go to work, and if you truly reflect on what's happened in your life in the last five years, surely a lot has happened. Surely, if you think about the last week of your life, something must have happened. I believe it as God's people, and we see this out of the life of Moses, that he made the very best of what was in front of him right there and then. Did he get it right every time? No. Did they spend 40 years walking around a desert? Yes. But did a lot happen during that time? Yes, it did. And I believe there is always an opportunity in our life for God to do something in our lives. In us, through us, where we're planted right now, in the job that you have, that maybe it does feel like Groundhog Dog. In that job, there is an opportunity for God to be at work in your life. I just think so often we, we just think same, same. What's been happening? Same, same. What's been happening? Same as yesterday. And if, if that is your life, my encouragement to you is to ask God, what do you have for me where you've placed me right now? You know, there is great purpose to where God would have you right now might not be the final destination for, for that part of your life, but it, there's a reason for where you are right now. And God, I don't believe we, we serve a God of Groundhog Day. I don't believe we serve a God that's like, every day is just going to be repetitive. That every day you enter your reading plan, it's going to be the same. No, it's going to be different. That when we seek him and ask, what do you have for me today where I am right now? I believe he will respond. Doesn't mean every day is going to be bright and exciting, but every day contains an opportunity for God to be at work in your life and to be doing something in you and through you. Where has he got you right now? You know, the other thing, that, the, the question that Moses answered a lot was, you know, what, what God was asking of him. There was an incredible obedience to God. Picture this, you're 120 years old and God asked you to climb a mountain. Not sure what Moses was, uh, might have a look into what his diet was maybe, because at 120 it says he was full of, full of strength and his eyesight was as good as ever. I'm like 39 and my eyesight's the worst it's ever been. <laughs> I want to know the secret to Moses at 120 that could see with 20-20 vision and climb a mountain. But there's a thing in Moses that when God told him to do something, he was obedient to that, that he would just go. There's a part of, of Moses that knew already that he wasn't going to get to enter that next chapter. You know, he was fit and healthy. He wasn't in the state of someone who was going to pass away. But I love that God doesn't leave him behind. He's come to this mountain. Let me show you. Let me, let me fulfill my promise to you that you're going to see the land that's going to go before your people. And you know what? He doesn't just leave him there. He could have left him out in the wilderness and gone, you know what? You're 120. You're fit. Good luck with the next chapter of life. But he doesn't, he, 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 he takes him. But there's an obedience to Moses to go, I'll climb. 
And in his obedience, he sees the promise that was fulfilled to him. Can you imagine that moment of going and seeing all of the land from where you are? And God saying, this was my promise that I've given to my people. And now you're going to lead them through. It's okay to, to know where we are and understand maybe what God has asked. Maybe you know what God is asking of you where you are right now. But there needs to be an obedience to carry that through. That we wouldn't just exist. We wouldn't just do same, same. We wouldn't just go through the motions. But there would be this desire, no matter where you're at in your journey, no matter how old or young you are, that while you're on this earth where God's placed your feet, you would be looking, what are you asking of me? And to have the obedience to see it through. Moses was obedient right to the end. Right to the end. The third thing you kind of see out of, out of this scripture in, in, in verse 9, it begins to talk about Joshua. And Joshua, who's, who's full of vision. And, and he's full of vision and full of wisdom. And the why is, it says, because Moses laid hands on him. I, I believe in this life that all of us need a Joshua. That the things that God does in and through our lives, that we're called to kind of rally around other people. To, to pass on maybe a little bit of what we know, to encourage one another in what we know. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone younger than you. But that we're not called to kind of do it alone. We're not called to keep things to ourselves. We're actually called to do things with others. The other day I was, I was chatting to a guy down at, down at a football club and he was an ex-player and, and it was down and, and he's like, oh, I'm just here to kind of help out. I'm like, oh, what, what are you here to do? And he's like, I, I don't know. I was like, okay, have they asked you to do something or are you like a, just, just hanging out? He's like, oh, no, I asked if I could, I could be here. And I was like, oh, so, so what's your, your, kind of your, your, your plan for this? He's like, oh, look, my kids don't play football. And he's like, I played AFL football and, and I've played state football and I, and I, and I feel like I've, I've had a lot of experience in sport, but my kids don't want it. They want to do other stuff. And I'm like, how do you feel about it? He's like, oh, that's fine. But he goes, I, I just have, the, there's this thing in me that I feel like I have stuff that I can pass on. And I don't really know what to do with that, so I just thought I'd come down here and see what I could do. And he's like, I've learned all these hard lessons along the way. I've made all these mistakes. I've had some great success, but I just feel like there's something in me that goes, I could help someone else in their journey. I'm like, That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Like, just come, what do I do? I'll just go down to a footy club, teach some kids to kick, whatever it might be. But he's like, I just want to get what I've learned and I want to pass it on to someone else. And I just thought, that's, that's really cool. And so I've been watching him over the last little while and, he, and, and how he goes and he'll stand and he'll talk and he'll constructive with, with some of these younger people and, and, and helping them be better at what they do. He's not getting paid for that. That's, he's giving up his time, volunteering his time to pass on a little bit of the wisdom and knowledge that he has to help someone else get better in their journey. And I think, shouldn't that be the picture for us as a church? That in the journey of life that we're on, where, where, where God has placed our feet, the lessons that we learn, the wisdom that we gain, that we could use that to encourage other people on their journey. That all of us would go, oh, do I have a Joshua somewhere? That I'm encouraging, that I'm passing what I've learned on, that I could be encouraging other people. I know that on my journey, there have been so many people who have done that for me that I haven't even asked, and they've come alongside and put their arm around me and said, hey, can I just spend some time with you and help you and encourage you in, in what you're doing? And the difference that that has made in my life. A lot of those people have been older than me, but you know what? The reality is there's a bunch that have been younger than me that I've been able to spend time with and learn from. And that, that I would be able to do the same for other people. That we don't just walk this journey to, to walk it alone and live out our own lives and see our own days. And you know, the, the reality is Moses sets up Joshua to go and lead the people into what is promised. I don't know how Moses might have felt about that. I wonder whether it would have been a bit hard for him. But the reality is he lays hands on this guy, blesses him, sets him up to go and do the next leg of the journey. Just wonder if there's anyone in your world that you're spending time with, rubbing shoulders with, to help them along the way. Help them along their journey. You know, Alpha is another one of those really simple ways we can do that. Sharing what we've experienced. Maybe giving an invite at a really simple level to go, hey, come and check this out. What a difference it's made to me. 
But I encourage you, don't journey by yourself. Journey with others. Encourage one another. And the last thing I, I wanted to pull out of this, and, and, and I, I really feel this is the key to Moses' journey the, the whole way. I love that in these verses it says, there has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. You know, there's an incredible desire in Moses to know God face to face. That he had incredible opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to converse with God. The Bible uses that phrase, face to face with God. At a time where God was seen to be distant and his people were separated from him, Moses had this unique relationship with God that was face to face. The reality is if we want to live a life that that matters, we want to make our life count, we want to get to the end and go, my life counted for something. So when we wake up tomorrow, we know that our life counts for something. It all comes down to being face to face with God. The direction that Moses received, the, the miracles that he did, all came from being face to face. Actually, so many of those things where Moses was face to face with God, he's like, I don't want to do that. Pick someone else. You know, you go back, he's like, You're going to lead the people. Oh, no, I think you got the wrong person, God. There's another guy who looks like me, maybe speaks better than me. Pick him. But constantly, God goes to Moses and calls him and encourages him to to go and do what he's been called to do. You know, if we want to live a life that counts, it all comes down to living face to face with God. You know, we got these uh, these journals that you might have seen over the last few weeks that that, that Pastor Dean has, has put together for us. This idea of having kind of vision around our lives and building habits that are going to allow us to fulfill those visions. If you don't have one of these, I'd encourage you to to pick one up and and do some work on that. You know, one of the things that we could build into this, and and one of the things that I want to continue to build into my journal, is how am I meeting with God face to face? Where are the rhythms and habits in my world that allow me to spend the time, deliberately spend the time, set aside to meet with God, to pray, to listen, you know, Moses didn't just talk at God all the time. So much of it was God going, you're going to do this. He's like, ooh. There's this reality that we can go through the motions. We can, we can, we can be right where God has called us to be. We can, we can be in the thick of it. But if we're not meeting with him, we're missing something huge. And so my great encouragement to us today, on the first day of the week on a Sunday, is to have a look at the rhythm of your week and go, is there time in my world where I'm making space to meet with God? You know, we make a lot of space in our, in our world to, to have meetings. I know I do. What I, you know, we put them in our calendar. We, we set reminders so that we don't forget. For some of us, our, our jobs are completely reliant on the people that we meet with. Yet so often I can get to the end of my week and go, oh, God, I'm sorry, I was busy. I was meeting with people, you know, like I was doing your work, Lord. And the the picture I get is that sometimes I can be doing that without him. Sometimes I can be doing that without inviting him in to what I'm doing. Maybe because it's good, maybe because it's noble, maybe because it just feels same, same. So you feel like, oh, like God's not in the same, same. Well, if you don't want the the same, same, if I don't want the same, same, got to make time to meet with God face to face. And so if you don't have one of these, I just encourage you to get one. And the number one thing I I would encourage you to do out of this time that we've had together is to have a look at the rhythm of your life and look for the spaces now where you make time for God. Have a look at where that sits in the shape of your week. And have a look and just see, is there anything missing there? Could there be more time that I could spend with God? And I'm not saying you have to like, you know, you've got an eight-hour day, uh, you need to carve out 50% of that for the Lord. Like, that's not, that's not the goal here to go, the more that's in there, the better, the, the, the better you are. But this reality that the more we meet with God, the more we learn to hear his voice, the more we're aligned with who he is, the more desire in us there should be to do that. The deeper the relationship would, would get. You know, that, that difference between a friend I could see every five years and say, life hasn't really changed much. 
compared to someone that I, that I see and journey and do life with every day, the relationship and the conversation is completely different, isn't it? You know, I don't want God to be this distant friend that I go, yep, still, still doing the Bible 365, Jesus, thanks. We're all good here. You know, the, the reality is, I don't want to get to the end of my week and go, I didn't, I didn't spend any time with, with God. I don't, have anything, I don't have anything new here. But there would be something new every day in the time that I spend with him. That almost if there was a day missed of not being able to, to meet with God, to pray, to, to spend time with him, that I would feel like there was something missing from my day. The world programs us to be so busy that we miss this. It's a really simple tool that I believe that culture puts in front of us to allow us to miss what God has for us. It's just to be too busy to do it. To get all the other priorities in first and then see where it fits. My encouragement to you is to have a look at the rhythm of your life. Have a look at where your relationship with God is. That's not for me to, to tell you where that is or, or what that might look like. But to maybe just grab one of these and go, what, what, do I, what, what does it look like for me? Maybe even write that down. What does it look like for me to be face-to-face -face with God? And then how can I lean into that more every day, every week? What rhythms and habits do I need to write down and set? What people can I gather around and encourage? What people could I find that might be able to encourage me to do this more? Because it's so much easier when we do it with other people. But I believe as we do that, Wherever we are, whatever God is asking us to do, it's going to be so much more clear. He's going to be so much more involved because we've got him right at the center of who we are. You know, this morning we're going to, we're going to wrap up our time together by taking communion. And this morning I was sitting with my, my kids. We were taking communion as a, as a group of volunteers. I was sitting with my kids and they're always just keen for the cracker and the juice. I think it's just like, we need a snack, Dad. We've been here since 7.30. Can we have something to eat? You know, that's the, the vibe going on. I said to my boy this morning, I was like, do you, do you remember why we're doing this? And he's like, yes, yeah, to remember Jesus. <laughs> you know, like, and I was like, what about it? You know, like, so he starts kind of reciting, you know, Jesus died and the, the, the juice is the, you know, represents the blood and the cracker. And I look at my door and she's like, why is everyone so quiet? <laughs> she's like, these crackers are good, you know. And I'm like, oh, people are just remembering and, and reflecting on Jesus and what he did for us and She's like, oh, okay, cool, and just continue to <laughs> sip her juice. But my hope would always be as we, we come around the table, it's not just that I grab the, grab the emblems and I just take them because it's what we do. But actually it would be this great setting and reminder that because of what Jesus did for us, we're not separated from God anymore. We actually have the ability to have a face-to-face -face relationship with Him. That the things that would separate us from God actually can be removed at the table. There's actually a reminder that God's heart is not to be distant from you. How sometimes maybe the people felt. But actually his heart is to live a life with you, face to face. He is interested in your day. He's interested in your week. He's interested in your family. He's interested in what happens in your life. So much so that he went to the cross to make sure we could have that relationship with him. And so I don't, know where you're at this morning, not sure necessarily something, but where your life is at and where your relationship with God is at. But here's what I know is that in front of us, there's this beautiful picture of a, of a Christ that went to the cross so that we could live face to face with Him. And I know for each of you today, He's placed you in, in certain spheres of life, certain seasons of life. And He wants to do that season of life with you. Might be easy, might, be, might feel easy and good right now, might feel hard and difficult right now. Whatever it might be, there's a Jesus that wants to do it face to face with you. And so my encouragement would be as we, we come around the table today, that we would be able to acknowledge what He has done for each one of us. And that out of that would grow a desire to spend more time face to face with Christ. because of all that He has done for us, we can have a relationship with Him. And so the band are gonna just lead us in a, in a song as we do that. And I love that song. It's actually all about coming to the altar. It was about Jesus' arms being open wide. Actually, He doesn't stand off to the distance. He doesn't, 
He's not a God waiting for you to get it right before He wants to be in relationship with you. It's that He's, he's there waiting for you. Arms wide open. Ready for a relationship with Him. You know, you might, on your journey, as, you're, as we're doing that, want someone to pray with you. We're going to have prayer teams and staff kind of off to the sides here. As you take your communion, you might say, I, I, just, I just need someone to pray for me in the season that I'm at right now. Someone would love to do that with you. But I just encourage you this morning, wherever your journey is at, whatever face-to-face with God looks like for you right now, to take a moment around the cross, to be thankful for all that He is and all that He has done, but also to pray for a greater desire. Because I know for me, it doesn't, it, my desire will never be large enough for what Christ has for me. I'll never spend as much time with Him as, as I always want to or that He would want to spend with me. But desire, desire more of Him and less of what's in the world. Can I pray for us and then we'll, we'll take communion together. Lord, we thank you for this, this picture of Moses, a life that achieved and counted for so much. But Lord, a life that was so centred around being face to face with you, to hear your voice, to be led and guided by you. And Lord, may that be a picture that we take hold of and take home with us today. A desire to live face to face with you. That every day with its challenges and its ups and its downs would be guided by you. Lord, may we be a people who are led into all that you have for us. And it's in your name we pray.